We'll hear argument first this morning in case 09-11311, Sykes versus United States. Justice Ginsburg is not on the bench, but will participate in the argument through the transcripts and the, and the tapes. Mr. Marsh. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court, the Armed Career Criminal Act enhances the punishment for possession of a firearm or ammunition for a person who has three previous convictions for a violent felony. This case involves, uh, as you know, vehicular fleeing, which Indiana has divided into five categories. The Indiana statute uh, treats vehicular fleeing as a continuum of behavior ranging from merely failing to stop on the low end, which is the crime Mr. Sykes was convicted of violating, uh, all the way to fleeing, which results in the death of a police officer, on the high end, uh, which in Indiana is a Class A felony. What's in between? Uh, the second tier up is what we refer to as B1B, which is fleeing, which either causes bodily injury or creates a substantial risk of bodily injury. The next category up is fleeing, which ca- causes serious bodily injury. Fourth category is fleeing, which causes a death. This court recognizes. So we, we can assume that the conviction here did not involve any risk of bodily injury to anybody. That's our position, Your Honor. When the court considers the conduct encompassed by the elements of the offense, right. uh, then that conduct does not involve uh, conduct which creates a risk of bodily injury. Why I'm, I'm sure you'll do so in the course of, of your argument, but at, at some point, uh, give us some examples of uh, <coughs> violations of, 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 this, of this statute, which, from a common sense standpoint, don't involve a serious risk. Uh, there was something in the briefs about, oh, well, the uh, defendant might want to just find a safe place to pull over. Uh, I, I didn't follow that because it's an intent crime. I, I just don't see how that would be a violation. But if at some point in your argument you could address that, those points. Well, I'd be happy to respond now, Justice Kennedy. Uh, the court, the case that you referred to is the Indiana case uh, of Woodward from the Indiana Court of Appeals in which the court held that exactly that uh, conduct did violate uh, this statute uh, because the Knowingly or intentionally, the mens rea element goes only to fleeing and using a vehicle. Uh, so that was one example of uh, Look, merely failing look, to stop. I'm sorry. Looking, looking. I don't mean to interrupt your answer, but looking for a safe place to stop violates the statute. That was the holding of the Indiana Court of Appeals. Yes. So, so you're supposed to stop dead in your tracks and not pull off on the <laughs> shoulder. I mean, I don't. I don't. I just don't understand that. So I'll go read the case. But well, the court drive in uh, Indiana. I, I think that's. Uh, Pretty tough. The court did not elaborate, Your Honor, on where the line uh, is, but it was maybe that's why why it's a risk. You stop in the middle of the road, and then everybody will. <laughs> that would be more likely to create uh, a risk. But hold- how, how can you say somebody's fleeing? I mean, doesn't fleeing mean you're trying to escape the uh, uh, the officer? Justice Scalia, the holding of the Indiana Court of Appeals was in response to a position taken by the defendant, uh, sort of along the lines of the the two lines of questioning, which is surely the statute requires something more than merely failing to stop. Uh, But the Indiana Court of Appeals used precisely that language. I think the problem with your argument is that uh, the prosecution is not under any obligation to charge any offense greater than the offense for which your client was convicted in a case in which there is a very grave risk created by the flight. Isn't that true? The prosecutor is not under any obligation. Is, was that the question? Yeah. Yes, Lito? Yes, I think that's, uh, I think that's correct. The so you, the fact that someone is convicted of this offense does not show that uh, a broad category of offenses within this crime uh, lack the, the risk that's necessary under the Armed Career Criminal Act. Well, I suggest that it does, uh, Your Honor, because uh, the, the James case uh, makes clear that the court will determine whether the crime creates a serious potential risk uh, of physical injury to another by looking at the conduct encompassed by the elements of the offense. Now, the fact that some other offense 
maybe could have been charged or was charged, I suggest, on the categorical approach, uh, is not relevant. Are you, are you familiar with the case called Hape versus State, Indiana Court of Appeals, 2009? Tate versus Hape, <coughs> H-A-P-E. I'm not, Your Honor. Uh, during a 45 — and this involved the, the offense uh, at issue here. During a 45-minute high-speed chase, officer shot at the defendant's truck at least 20 times, the state's fact showed that the defendant drove over 100 miles per hour and at times drove into the oncoming traffic lane. Do you think that creates a, a serious potential risk of, of harm? Well, those, of course, uh, aren't the facts here, and I would have to know what the individual was convicted of, because, of course, under the category — I believe he's convicted of the same offense as, uh, as Mr. Sykes. But, of course, under the categorical approach established — by Taylor and followed consistently by this Court since that time. The Court doesn't look at the facts of the individual case. The Court looks at it categorically. So if yeah, the looking at it categorically, I've always thought, means you look to see not just what the elements are on paper, but whether the elements as, as used in, in reality in the State are applied to cases that do present, in general, applied to cases that do present a serious risk of physical injury. And you think the answer is we don't know, because no one's gone and looked. You could do it through sampling. But no one's gone and looked. I've just said that's my view of it. The, 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 uh, uh, so, so what do we do? I mean, I can deal with a lot of other states, but Arizona has exactly the same classification as a felony when you use a vehicle. And when you use a vehicle, creating a serious risk of physical harm to others. It's in the same provision, same statute, same category. How, how do we work with that, in your opinion? If the Are you following what I'm doing? You understand the difference between Arizona and 46 other states. Yes. In the other states, they grade it. But here they don't. Right. Well, Indiana, of course, does grade it, Your Honor. I mean, and, Indiana, Indiana, I'm sorry. Uh, and it is significant that — uh, the, the second most serious uh, category is where the conduct does present a substantial risk of bodily injury. And I, I, I don't know how, you, how we could proceed by, by looking at, you know, whether, in fact, uh, a majority of the cases that come into this first relatively harmless category did indeed involve situations that involved physical risk because, as everybody knows, uh, prosecutors plea bargain. And uh, it, it, it's probably very often the case that the defendant is charged only under, under Category 1, where, you know, if he went to trial, they'd charge him under 3. Isn't that so? But, of course, Your Honor, under the — Yes, yes. You want to say yes. That's <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. All right. Well, I, I still — look, what I'm thinking of, and I need a little explanation, uh, we look to see in B — and it says it's a Class D felony if a vehicle is used. That's A under 1. Am I right? Yes. Okay. Then we look to B under 1, and it's also a Class D felony, in other words, the same, if a vehicle is operated in a manner that creates a substantial risk of bodily injury. Yes. So a prosecutor looking at that will say, why don't I just charge A? What's the point of charging B? I mean — Makes no difference, apparently. So it's simpler to prove A. Justice Breyer, in, in 2003, when Mr. Sykes was convicted of this offense, uh, what you said is exactly right. Of course, we have no way of knowing the motivation of prosecutors generally, let alone uh, in this case. And it wouldn't really matter what it was in this case, what it is generally. But I think it's significant that in 2006, uh, the Indiana General Assembly amended that statute. So now — the B violation carries with it a mandatory jail sentence, 30, 60 days. Well, I can deal with it more easily uh, then, uh, at least I have in the — but what's worrying me now is what we're supposed to do is, is the offense an offense that presents a serious risk of physical injury to another? Yes. So we're here trying to decide whether the A one does. Yes. And the answer is, I don't know. And the reason I don't know is I don't know how that offense language of A is applied in Indiana. If the so do you know if Indiana has an enhancement for um, 
conviction sentencing enhancement of any kind for convictions that have an element of, of risk of harm to others? Your Honor, there are uh, a number of habitual sentencing enhancements, uh, one of which specifically rates, relates to driving. I can't say that it uh, is based on substantial. So it's possible that there is a there is a use of the difference between the two categories that might not be implicated in this case, but may lay the foundation for an enhancement later. Yes, yeah, so uh, that's a good point, uh, Justice Sotomayor. The the enhancements uh, generally in Indiana relate to previous convictions, uh, and so uh, I can't say for sure, but it's entirely possible that B. B1B would be a predicate crime for a habitual traffic offender, which is what it's In called. your brief, you take issue with the government's definition of aggressive. But would you give us yours? How well, would Your Honor, you define it and on what basis? Uh, Your Honor, the best uh, definition of aggressive that I've seen uh, was in the First Circuit opinion in the Herrick case, which is cited uh, in our brief, which uh, the First Circuit refers to as forceful action especially were intended to dominate or master. But on uh, general um, everyday language, it strikes me that when a, when a law enforcement officer wants somebody to stop, whether they're in a vehicle or not, uh, the, the fight or flee uh, sort of comes into uh, play. And the person who responds by going toward the police officer and resisting in that way, which is the first part of this Indiana uh, statute that would be acting in an aggressive way. The person who flees uh, is not acting in an aggressive way. They're trying to avoid the confrontation. They're trying to get away from uh, the law Mr. enforcement. Mr. Marsh, I, t- I take it that you would agree that B-1B is a violent felony under, fa- uh, under ACCA. Is that right? Your Honor, it may very well be. Um, it certainly would satisfy the risk element, similar in risk to the uh, to the Begay case. Uh, I think it would still have to be decided whether it's violent uh, and aggressive, but it may very well be. Well, if we think that B1B is a violent felony under ACCA, and we know that B1A and B1B uh, can receive the same punishment, that they're both classed as a, as a Class D felony, why should we make the distinction between the two under ACCA? Your Honor, I would suggest uh, because the Indiana General Assembly has decided in enacting this legislation that some vehicular fleeing presents a substantial risk of bodily injury to another, and some doesn't. Uh, and they've drawn this distinction. But I these presume are not that if nested offenses, these are Sorry. not these are not lesser included offenses. Each has an element that the other lacks, and both are classed with apparently that the that the state thinks of them as equally severe. And if one is a violent felony under ACCA. There's an argument that the other should be treated in the exact same way. Your Honor, I would suggest that the, that the state doesn't uh, treat them as equally severe. The range of punishment for a Class D felony, which both of those crimes are, is all the way from zero to three years in prison. And the actual conduct uh, undoubtedly uh, is a factor in what the person's ultimate sentence uh, will be. And it may well be that in deciding whether to uh, accept a plea bargain, of being guilty of A uh, uh, rather than going to trial on B uh, if your client has uh, two violent felonies uh, already on the book you might uh, take take the plea bargain under A uh, <clears throat> lest you uh, run afoul of the uh, uh, violent felony act yes your honor that's that's of course entirely possible but again uh, just as with the categorical approach uh, the court cannot take into account the motives of prosecutors. I would suggest the motives of defendants and defense lawyers can't be taken into account either. Further, I think it's, it's more important that uh, when Indiana enacted this statute, uh, it was not thinking of ACCA and predicate crimes, I, I assume. I don't think the legislature uh, takes those kind of things into account. I suppose the legislature were to repeal uh, B-1B. Would the offense for which Mr. Sykes was convicted then become an ACCA offense? Your Honor, I, uh, that would be a question that would have to be decided on the basis of whether there's some basis to, well, first of all, determine whether it's violent and aggressive. Uh, and my position would remain it's still not violent and aggressive. But even on the second part of the Begay uh, approach, uh, this Court has not seen 
anything that uh, gives you any basis for knowing what the uh, risk uh, of injury is. I don't understand your answer to that question. I would have thought that your answer, if you're insisting on a categorical approach, would be no. That there's nothing in, in, in three that uh, requires any violence at all, just fleeing by visible or audible means. Uh, just, just flees. That's all it says. I'm sorry. I understood the question to be that A is repealed and B is left in place. Was that no, it's the opposite. If the aggravated offense, you you, are, you rely on the aggravated offense right. in large part as a basis for your argument. You, your argument, one of your main arguments, as I understand it, is that what I'll call the simple offense doesn't qualify under ACCA because cases involving a serious risk of bodily injury fall under the aggravated category. And my question is whether a repeal of the aggravated offense would change, would uh, then convert the simple offense from a non-ACCA offense to an ACCA offense. Or you could ask it a different way. If State 1 has the simple offense and the aggravated offense, State 2 has just the simple offense. Is the simple offense an ACCA offense in one state and not in the other state, even though the elements are exactly the same? Your Honor, the equation would be different uh, because uh, th of the significance of the B offense. So that's not exactly our case. But uh, I will adopt Justice Scalia's answer, which I think is exactly right. I th it still would not be something that's violent. Uh, but you're, you're, but you're, you're answering my question by making a totally different argument. Insofar as you're relying on, on the aggravated offense, the presence of the aggravated offense, I, I would appreciate uh, an answer to it. Justice Alito, the — In other words, you're saying — maybe I haven't made myself clear. You're, 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 you, Justice Scalia's answer, which you've adopted, is that uh, if you look at A by itself, forget about the aggravated offense completely, it doesn't qualify under ACCA. And that's, uh, that, that's, that's one argument. But your, uh, your other argument is that, the, that A, the simple offense, doesn't qualify because of the presence of B. And I'm trying to see — whether that makes sense. Yes, uh, Justice Alito, I think it, it, it breaks down to the two parts of the Begay uh, test. Uh, in order to be a violent felony, it has to be similar in kind and similar in degree of risk. The existence of B uh, makes clear that the degree of risk for violating A is not the same, because if you uh, accept the continuum of behavior as created by the Indiana General Assembly, uh, the person who's convicted of A uh, has not created a substantial risk of bodily injury. Counsel, have you done or looked at not every burglary has a risk of harm to another or results in harm to another? The general definition of burglary is entering without permission and intent to commit a crime, and generically the crime doesn't have to be physical injury to others. Right. Yet, ACCA defines burglary as a qualifying crime of violence. It's measuring risk not by the elements of that crime, but by something else, by some measure of incidents in which violence might occur. So how is that different than the government's argument here and the question that Justice Breyer asked you, which was, it is true, potentially there's some forms of fleeing that might not pose a risk of injury, but statistically there's a large number of incidents in which violence follows. So how is that different than burglary? That's really my question. What uh, It can't be that the elements have to pose a risk of injury because burglary doesn't do that. So what — how do we measure it? Your Honor, the uh, inquiry, as, uh, as the Court said in James, is whether the conduct encompassed by the elements of the offense presents uh, the risk. And that's the, the determination that the Court uh, has to uh, consider. Uh, it's not, it is not necessary, and I'm not contending that uh, this crime is a violent felony only if every conceivable violation of the statute uh, constitutes 
uh, a risk of danger. That, so if you're that, not doing that, that's my question. Where do we draw the line? You at draw that, it, I'm sorry? Where do we draw the line? You draw I the line. I think that was just what Justice Breyer was trying to ask you earlier, um, which is when do we say that, as in burglary, that some risk is more likely to follow than not in a particular type of crime? Well, the, the line is defined by the statute, a serious potential risk of physical injury to another. Now, how do you make that determination? Uh, well, the Court made clear in chambers that empirical data is one way to do it. Uh, there isn't any here uh, because of all the empirical data uh, presented by the government. It relates to vehicular fleeing as if there was one crime of vehicular fleeing, and most of it uh, is, uh, is calculated based on death or injury, and that, of course, is not the category that we have here. I suppose that if we agreed with you that uh, whether it uh, is a violent crime depends upon what other prosecutions for fleeing could have been brought. If we agree with you that uh, that uh, 1A is, uh, is negligible because there are other bigger ones for which he wasn't charged, we could leave open the question of what, uh, what happens in a state that has only one crime for fleeing. Uh, then, we would, then we would have to confront the question that uh, uh, Justice Sotomayor has asked. But uh, if we accept your uh, notion that uh, uh, where you have a gradation that is adopted by the state, the lowest gradation uh, cannot be determined to have a high percentage of uh, bodily risk, right? Uh, yes, that's correct, Justice My Lee. problem is there is arguably not here a gradation. But suppose it only had A. If it only had A, for me, I'm not saying for you, this wouldn't be a tough case. That is to say, I can't imagine a person running away from a police in a car where there isn't a real risk to other people. He's speeding, you know. I would think, I don't see how you get away from the policeman unless you speed. And they're going to be pedestrian. Who knows? But I think that was pretty, at least as bad, at least as much of a risk as burglary. So that'd be the end of the case. It would be simple. At least assume that. Now then, however, suppose we have a state which says, but it's a worse thing to run away and create a risk in a separate provision. It's a worse thing. All right, then I'd say, huh, now I'm not so sure. Why didn't they charge the worse thing? This must be reserved for cases where it isn't. So here we have a rather weird situation. They're saying it's a different thing, but not a worse thing. So now I say, well, why didn't they charge? Huh, now I don't know. I don't know why they didn't charge the, the SEP special one. I don't know what the facts are. I'm puzzled. Now, that's your case. That's where I needed the enlightenment. So what's the enlightenment? Your Honor, it's not a weird situation uh, because <coughs> the Indiana — definition of the crime of vehicular fleeing is not one uh, all-encompassing uh, crime. It's, it, they, they took the all-encompassing generic vehicular fleeing uh, and divided it into five subparts, which I suggest makes it much easier to resolve the B1A question. Uh, if there is no uh, other categories, uh, that would be Justice Scalia's uh, uh, point, I think. And then it would be a much harder uh, question, and it may very well be uh, that it would be considered a violent felony. For isn't one thing, it still, isn't it still an empirical question? Uh, if we were to look at all of the cases that are prosecuted under what I'll call the simple offense, we might discover that those are all cases in which there is no serious potential risk of physical injury created because all of the risky cases are prosecuted under the aggravated label. We might also find that there are still a great many cases that involve a serious potential risk that are prosecuted under the simple category. So it, the fact that there's a gradation doesn't allow us to escape the empirical issue, does it? No, I, I think you're exactly right, Justice Alito. That would be possible. Empirical data uh, could show uh, what you have just suggested. Of course, that would be uh, indicating that the Indiana General Assembly didn't have any rational basis for for dividing the two. But the important thing here is — It wouldn't show that they didn't have a rational basis for dividing it. It would just show a pattern of prosecution and, and plea bargaining. That's what it would show. 
But it, the, the important thing here, Your Honor, is there simply is no such data before this Court. Uh, there, there is no empirical data uh, regarding B1A. But there never is uh, really reliable empirical data, almost never, for any of the issues that have to be decided under the, the, uh, the catch-all, uh, the, the, the residual clause of ACCA. It has to be based on basically common sense and experience, doesn't it? Your Honor, I suggest that common sense and experience uh, is not a reliable, predictable way of deciding these cases. Uh, you're right. There frequently is not empirical data. Uh, if there's not either empirical data that demonstrates uh, the danger involved or uh, a crime that it, where the danger is pretty obvious uh, so that there would be widespread general agreement, uh, common sense uh, is what has led to a lot of the conflicts uh, in the circuits, uh, I would suggest. I reserve my time, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Marsh. Mr. Wall. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court. <laughs> I, just a very quick moment of history, I think, provides some useful background. And I'm on page 3A of the appendix to the government's brief. Until 1998, subsection B, which we've been talking about, was the only Class D felony that involved vehicular flight in Indiana law. In 1998, the Indiana General Assembly broke out and enacted subsection A so that in cases of vehicular flight, prosecutors would not have to prove risk. They would just have to prove that the defendant used a vehicle. Since 1998, I found 14 cases in the Indiana Court of Appeals, one of which is the Hape case that Justice Alito cited earlier. All of them, so far as I can tell, proceeded under A and not under B. Of those 14 cases, 13 have enough facts to tell what the flight was of what kind. Ten involve speeding, disregarding traffic laws, or striking an officer with the vehicle. Of the other three, only one involved non-risky behavior. And even that was not a defendant who drove a short distance and then pulled over. It was a defendant. These were all litigated cases? Uh, yes, Justice Scalia. These were all litigated to conviction and taken up on appeal, and the Indiana Court of Appeals addressed well, various legal not, issues. Uh, Fourteen isn't very many, and I assume the vast majority of these cases aren't litigated. I think that's right, Mr. Chief Justice. The government's point is that here we have extensive data, both empirical and otherwise, that indicates that flight as a basic offense is very dangerous. Well, and I read your Indiana brief, and I was — I read, read your brief and was surprised that when you're — the list, one of the things you talk about to show that is media reports. You usually have more concrete basis for, for speculation than media reports. Mr. Chief Justice, if that is all we had put forward, I, I might agree with you, but we also put forward extensive statistical data. My point is just that Indiana is typical. It's dangerous everywhere else. It's four times as dangerous as arson. It's more dangerous than household burglary. There's nothing different about Indiana. If one so, looks through the cases, these flights in Indiana are typically quite dangerous. Suppose you have a state that has a separate crime for trespassing, criminal trespass, and you're, you're saying that if uh, — if you could show that a large number of cases that were brought under criminal trespass, in fact, could have been prosecuted under burglary, then criminal trespass would uh, qualify as a, vi as a violent felony. That doesn't, seem, that doesn't seem to me right. Justice Scalia, I thought — Just because prosecutors make that choice, that doesn't establish that the — the elements of the crime, which is what we focus on in deciding whether it's a violent felony, uh, fill the bill. That's right. This Court looks at the conduct encompassed by the elements in a typical case. And in a typical case of vehicular flight, what we have, according to the data, is someone fleeing police at an average of 25 miles an hour over the speed limit, someone who is in the typical case young, male, unlicensed, under the influence of alcohol, and who places the lives of other motorists, pedestrians, and police in harm's way. Your approach to ACA, Justice Scalia, has been to look at the conduct encompassed by the elements and to ask whether the risk from that conduct is at least as great as the, the least risky enumerated offense. That ignores here, the in-kind requirement of Begay, because you seem to be confusing um, the risk of, of violence with the in-kind inquiry. And that's where I'm trying 
I'd like you to concentrate a little bit on, which is um, in burglary, the defendant is breaking into generally a place and going without permission and commit with an intent to commit a crime. How is that comparable to merely not stopping when a police officer tells you not to stop? How is that an in-kind? Justice Sotomayor, it's absolutely true there are two parts of the test, and we've been talking about the first risk. On the second prong, the purposeful, violent, or aggressive character of the conduct. Here, I think there are three distinct things that, that make it purposeful, violent, and aggressive. First, you have the defiance of the officer's order, which can cause injury at the scene. It has in some Indiana cases, but at least calls the officer to give chase. Second, you have the very real no, prospect. What you're doing is saying I'm not — you're not even saying I'm not stopping. You're just driving away. Well, yes, but you're How, driving — How is that — you're driving away in response to an officer's command to stop. You're calling the officer to give chase. Your, your, your pursuit is likely. And even when there isn't pursuit, these offenders drive typically very recklessly. And then you've got the confrontation That's when the officer has to of, terminate that, the flight. That, that is all the risk question. Um, and, and you're confusing the police actions with the defendant, because you're, you're talking about the defendant responding to a police pursuit. So — what, what is in the act of the crime that makes it in kind to burglary? So let me analogize. I, I would concentrate to, on burglary because the others don't. No, let me concentrate on burglary then and analogize it to what this Court said in James. So the risk of attempted James, burglary. James predated Begay. So That's right. That, but I, it, the Court has talked about, even in Chambers, about the risk of a violent confrontation with law enforcement officials, and it's done that under the Begay part of the test. And whereas that confrontation is only possible with burglary, it's necessary with this crime. It requires that an officer order you to stop and that you flee. So that, that confrontation, which is only a possibility with burglary or attempted burglary, is elevated to a certainty with this Well, offense. Mr. Wall, wouldn't that suggest that if I just ran from a police officer, it would be a violent felony under ACCA? I think it, it — it would suggest that, Justice Kagan, but I think flight on foot is unlikely to satisfy the risk part of the test. Um, I think certainly this case is much easier on the, the James part of this test. I, I think the, the flight in a vehicle poses risks, very real risks, to other motorists and pedestrians and police that flight on foot doesn't pose, although you'd still have the confrontation when the flight on foot was terminated. So I think some of the arguments would translate. You're right. I, I think there would be more difficult questions, though, on the risk problem. This do, is a do, do words case. mean nothing? I mean, we're talking about a violent felony. That's what the federal law requires. And, and you want us to hold that, that failing to stop when a police officer tells you to stop is a violent felony. That, that seems to me a, 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 a big leap. I mean, words have some meaning. And Congress uh, focused on violent felonies. I, Justice Scalia, words do have meaning. But the words here are very broad. Serious potential risk of physical injury to others. And as you yourself have recognized in, in multiple opinions, what those words call for is a comparison of risk between an offense and ACCA's enumerated crimes. This offense, simply put, is more risky. It's four times as risky as arson in terms of injuries and fatalities. Well, it's one more of the, risky than household burglary. An, another word is aggressive in Begay, and that's where I have a little difficulty with your argument. It seems to me this is the exact opposite of aggressive. He's running away. Um, certainly if, uh, the other option is to turn and, and uh, confront, and he doesn't want to. There's nothing aggressive about running away. Well, I, there is, Mr. Chief Justice, when you're doing it in a vehicle and typically at high speeds. So in chambers — That's the risk of violence. I understand that. And purposeful, which I, I guess everything is. But those are the three words, purposeful, uh, violent, and aggressive. I'll give you purposeful. I'll give you violent. But aggressive — Mr. Chief Justice, if you give me those two, I think we're home free, because this Court said <laughs> in chambers — I think you're, you're two-thirds of the way home free. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll take it, and let's work on the last third. So the — what this Court said in chambers is not all attempts to evade authorities are of the same stripe. So it contrasted escape from prison with failure to report. Failure to report, you could do it home on your couch. You could just fail to show up. And the Court said, look, that's passive. It's a crime of inaction. This is not that. It's not sitting at home on its couch. This is quintessentially a crime of action. There's a difference. The opposite of passive uh, is active. It's not aggressive. Well, but uh, — This is active. He's running away, but 
I, I think the aggression. But it's, very, it's, it's hard to see what the difference would be between this and escape from custody. And this Court clearly indicated in, in chambers that escape from custody was different from failure to report under the statute in front of it. And I think this is as dangerous, maybe even more dangerous, than escape from custody. If the Court were going to say that all running away could not be aggressive within the meaning of that word for begay purposes, so too escape from a maximum security federal prison, which in some sense is just running away. But it is extremely aggressive, and it's extremely risky to others. Mr. Wall, do you think that um, speeding or drag racing qualifies under your understanding of the test? Justice Kagan, that's a difficult question. I don't know that I've seen any uh, attempt to fit that offense in under the ACCA. Um, I think that drag racing, where you're talking about speeds of 150, 160, 170 miles an hour, might qualify, but I haven't seen any cases like that. Um, what about speeding? Just, just you know, you're, you're going 15 miles over the speed limit. I, again, Is that I — a violent felony? Just Scalia, I think then we'd have a serious question about the first part of the analysis and the the risk test. I mean, 10, 15 miles over. Or, I mean, speeding as a generic offense is likely to encompass. I mean, it encompasses categorically all speeding offenses, many of which are, you know, not that, uh, not likely to pose a serious risk to others. So I, I we'd have to look at the, the data. What we do have here is data that says this offense is four times as risky as the enumerated offense of arson. So I, I speeding would be a difficult case. So far as I know, we yeah, speeding, the government's never tried to make that felonies. Case. Not as far as I know, not the basic offense. Now, whether in a begay type sense you might have some recidivism enhancement under state law that would get you there, I don't know. Um, but I, I, again, I haven't seen any case that involved that. Am I right about uh, I, when you replied to Justice Scalia? I thought that he'd said that we were dealing with a statute, and you seem to agree, that said it is a crime to flee a policeman after being ordered to stop. But I thought we were dealing with a statute that says it is a crime to flee a policeman after being ordered to stop in a vehicle. That's right. right? That's right. That's the offense and here. So you're, I, okay. It's the vehicular flight offense. Mm-hmm. And, and one, you know, I will take one issue with, with you know, what, what my friend on the other side has said, which is A and B are not tiered. They're not greater and lesser offenses under state law. But Mr. Wall, suppose they were. I understand your point that they're not, and you might be right about that. Um, but let's suppose that they were. Let's suppose you had a three-tier setup. One was simple flight. One was flight that causes risk of injury. One that is a flight that causes injury. And let's even say that the simple flight — no, let's, let's, let's call them all felonies, but different classes of felonies. What would happen in that case? Would you still be here saying that the simple flight felony is a violent crime? Yes, it's a tougher case, but we would be here saying that, because when you're looking at an offense categorically, for instance, arson, you've got to look at all fires, all intentionally set fires, the ones that don't hurt anybody, the ones that do, and the ones that kill people, even though the fires that kill people will be prosecutable in most jurisdictions as a greater offense like felony murder. And so when you're looking at it categorically, you've got to look at all of the conduct in that category, even conduct that may be prosecutable under some greater offense. I think, you know, the other side sort of relies on this assumption that all conduct which might satisfy the greater will necessarily be prosecuted under the greater. And as a legal matter, it's included within the lesser. And as a factual matter, it's just not true that it always gets prosecuted under that greater offense. So it's, it would be a tougher case. It would make our case more difficult. But I think legally and factually, the government's answer would be the same. I, I uh, asked my clerk to just do a survey of the states, and he came up with, and I'm sure that this is rough, but that 46 of the states have these tiered systems. Now, there may be some questions as to some of them, like you've raised some questions about Indiana's, but that 46 states essentially conceive of this as two different kinds of conduct, one which is the violent kind and the other which is the not violent crime. Well, my state law research is a little different from your clerk's. I've got 37 states in D.C., but the the point is that under the nested statutes, the aggravator isn't always like this one, risk. Sometimes it's, as in Indiana, injury or death. And where you're talking about actual injury or death, those aggravators far outstrip the level of potential risk that ACCA requires. So I don't think in those states, uh, petition, we even have an argument 
that those aggravators would affect at all the analysis of the basic offense. There are a handful of states that, unlike Indiana, have as an aggravator risk, though even some of those states treat the basic offense as a felony, which is, I think, a judgment by the state that even in the basic case, this is risky conduct, uh, deserving of severe punishment under state law. So, um, you know, I, there are nested statutes. Not necessarily but, risky. Uh, uh, conduct that shows uh, disrespect for the law. I, Justice Scalia, I mean, I, again, I think it is significant that in 1998, the General Assembly broke this out as a st- separate subsection and said, we're not even going to require prosecutors to prove risk. I think that represents a judgment by the state that the conduct is risky on a typical basis. We just want the state to prove you. Or that it, even if it isn't risky, you should not thumb your nose at the police when they tell you to stop. Well, that's right. And the reason — Risk should, or not. The reason you shouldn't, Justice Scalia, is because that's the kind of purposeful, violent, and aggressive conduct the state wants to deter by treating as a felony. But, I, I mean, I, whether one looks at the risk prong and the data and the cases in Indiana or elsewhere, or whether one looks at the character of the conduct — this offense is just different in both degree and kind from the offenses that this Court has said fall outside of ACCA's residual clause. It's much more like escape from custody. It's much more like the enumerated offenses. Indeed, the, the risk of confrontation is certain. I mean, I, it, it's important, I think, that — I mean, I, these, these flights are not calm affairs. They're dangerous events. The average speed that the offender is traveling nationwide is 25 miles an hour over the speed limit. This is someone who, on average, is young, unlicensed, influenced I thought by alcohol. There was, I don't know where — I don't remember where this from. I thought there was a development of best police practices that you don't just chase people, you know, if they're going 30 miles an hour over the speed limit through a school zone. That doesn't mean the police officer should do that. You know, you call ahead, they put these strips on the road, whatever. <coughs> Mr. Chief Justice, that's right. I, I think police to agencies — have been struggling with this question, which is why there's a lot of data on police pursuits, frankly, especially in the last 10 or 15 years. I think some of them are becoming more restrictive. And so the data picks up pursuits. It doesn't pick up all flights. And I think if there were sound evidence that when people were not pursued, they were actually driving at low speeds and safely, that would affect the data, though not so much that it would move it outside of similarity to the enumerated offenses. But I I think that the the data is pretty good in indicating that the typical flight is — really does pose a serious potential risk of physical injury to others, a risk that materializes more often than with other crimes that Congress clearly intended to fall within the ACCA. Could I ask you this? If a person is convicted of vehicular flight that causes death, is that aggressive conduct? Yes. We, the government would say it is, Justice Alito. And is the conduct there any different from the conduct when death doesn't result? No, just Leo. The government's answer is that categorically the behavior is aggressive and that in some cases it will result in injury or death and in some it will not. But in all cases it carries that potential. It doesn't, uh, whether it's aggressive or not, depend upon how it happened? I mean, it could be, um, I, I mean, the flight puts in place the potential for for violence. I agree with that. But if somebody just, you know, jumps out between two cars um, uh, while the fellow's fleeing, uh, how is his conduct changed to aggressive? It's not, like he, it's not like he's aiming for the guy. I mean, it's putting it in a dangerous situation. It's purposeful. Again, I'll give you violent in the sense that it has that potential. But he didn't want to hit the, the person. It's not aggression there's, there's, against the there's person. There's no question that on a case-by-case <clears throat> basis you could flee in a way that was not very risky, that was not very violent or not very aggressive. And if this Court went on a case-by-case basis, then we'd look at the conduct here, and the government would still win, because this is the typical But he's case. saying even when it's risky, it's not aggressive. And I it, — my You answer, can be risky and not aggressive, can't you? Uh, yes, on a case-by-case basis, but categorically, which is what this Court looks at, the conduct encompassed by the elements in the ordinary case — in the ordinary case, the character of the conduct is aggressive. Who's he aggressing against? When someone sees the police and says, I'm getting out of here, and drives down the highway, say, at 80 miles an hour, you know, 25 miles above the speed limit, who is he — I'm sure it's not the right verb, but who is he aggressing against? Well, I don't know that he's aggressing against anyone in the same way that if I recklessly fire a gun into a large crowd of people, 
you know, I haven't aggressed against anyone in particular. He's aggressed against anyone who strays into his field of flight and who could be injured by what is typically a high-speed flight and pursuit. So I, I don't — there is no specific target, but that will be true of many of the crimes that are violent felonies, that the, the aggressive no, nature of the conduct is not there's no general. specific target. There's no target. What this guy hopes is that nobody gets in his way. Well, isn't so, too, with the burglar, who hopes that no one will come home. Maybe even the arsonist, who hopes no one is in the house. Or the extortionist, who hopes someone will pay. Yeah, but they're mentioned. Use violence. They're mentioned. They're mentioned, and you're trying to get this in under the residual clause. That's right, uh, Justice Scalia. A residual clause that, as you yourself have recognized, is extremely broadly worded. It, 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 does, it abstracts out as the quality of the enumerated offenses that they create a serious potential risk of physical injury to others. And I can't find any metric along which f- flight doesn't do that, whether one looks through the cases, media reports, the statistical data, whatever one lo- — Indiana, nationally, whatever standard or metric one uses, this is an extremely risky offense to others. And, I, you know, so I, it's, it's very difficult to figure out what test — what interpretation of that language would exclude this from from well, I suppose you have one of 36 states which treat this treat the general offense as a misdemeanor and then make it a felony if you put somebody at risk just reading that statute you'd think those 36 states when they have the general offense do something where the guy acted pretty trivially and where it's a felony, he actually put somebody at risk, sped off. Wouldn't that be your normal instinct in just guessing from the, from the language? Justice Breyer, the states, How are we supposed to treat those where there's a misdemeanor? The in your states, opinion, uh, it's just a misdemeanor. We also treat it the same way, say it's a violent felony? The states treat it differently. Some, as indeed right. it does. And that's actually the question. Are we supposed to, in this federal statute, try to track whether it's a misdemeanor, what the language is? We're going to have a nightmare of a federal law for, for states to uh, — uh, f- for judges to figure this out. I mean, every little variation in thousands and thousands of possible variations could make a difference as to whether it's violent or not, depending on data which no one will have. Uh, Justice Breyer, I don't think so. If the Court were to, f- to affirm here, what that would mean is that the offense of flight is a violent felony insofar as you have a predicate conviction under a state statute where it's been punishable by up to a year, and so it could qualify for ACCA coverage. Now, some state convictions will have been treated as misdemeanors and won't be eligible for ACCA, but to the extent a state treats it as a felony, it's risky enough to satisfy the residual clause. Now, if the Court treats A and B as what they are not, which is greater or lesser, then yes, I think there'll be problems with various state statutes, as Justice Kagan pointed out, and this Court may have to clear it up down the road. But if it treats this basic offense as what it is, not a greater or lesser, but alternative means of proving a single offense that is risky, that would, I think, take care of all flight cases going forward. Well, on this question of whether this statute is greater or lesser, it's greater or lesser if you just understand B1A as confined to vehicular flight. In other words, if one looks only at vehicular flight, then B1A and B1B are indeed greater or lesser offenses. Yes, Justice Kagan, if you're looking only — I take it you're looking only at the vehicle prong of B. But the test in Schmuck is whether it's impossible to create — to commit the greater without committing the lesser. It's not impossible to commit B because it does have the two other prongs. And I think — Do you think that if I flee in a vehicle, I could be prosecuted under both and receive sentences under both? No, I don't think so, because I think the — there is no evidence — no case in Indiana that I'm aware of, there's no evidence that the General Assembly intended these to be multiple punishments for a single incident. They're alternative means of proving a single offense. The State has always treated them that way, so far as I can tell. I have have not seen — I've seen prosecutions since 1998 that were all under A. I haven't seen anything that went under A and B and tried to get multiple punishments. Wait a minute. I'm a little confused by what you said and what point you're making. You don't think that B is a lesser included of A? I, is a, uh, no, that A is a lesser included of B? I, I, Your Honor, the government does not think that A is a lesser included of B. You can't commit B without committing A first. I, B has just one additional element, but all of the elements of A are part of the elements of B. So how can it not be a lesser included? Well, the, the element of B that's different, Justice Sotomayor, is the while committing any offense described in subsection A. 
So you can be resisting an officer or you can be obstructing the service of process and you can endanger someone in various ways, including with a vehicle, and you will have violated B and you can be prosecuted for that, and there are cases in Indiana like that, and you have not uh, flee — you have not been fleeing in a vehicle from an officer at any point. So you haven't violated A. So the, the existence of the other prong there, that's what I was trying to get into, Justice Kagan, means that this is not a greater or lesser. But as to vehicular flight only, it would be greater or lesser. If you divided up the prongs under schmuck, but I think the schmuck, it, what follows logically from that test is that you look at the entire offense and ask whether it's possible to commit it without committing the lesser, and that test is not satisfied here. I don't think you carve it up prong by prong. I, I'm — this is greater or lesser for purposes of, of what? Double jeopardy? I, no, it's greater or lesser for purposes of petitioner's argument that you should assume that every risky flight gets prosecuted under B and hence A is a non-risky offense. And that argument fails for multiple reasons, one of which I was trying to spin out. It's not even true that this is greater or lesser. No, well, I, I, I just don't follow that argument. I mean, it, it, it seems to me that uh, — Yes, you, you, you could, you could uh, uh, run afoul of B by uh, committing uh, an offense under, under subsection little a in some other ways. But if you run afoul of B by committing the offense of, uh, of, of flight from a law enforcement officer, it seems to me that uh, that automatically includes A. Well, except that there are two alternative means of proving the same offense under state law. They have the same state law penalties. So the prosecutors can go under A or they can go under B. And as far as I can tell, for the last, uh, say, 13 years, they've been going under uh, — they've been going under A. So it's not — just it's not a — there are aggravators in the statute for injury or death. They're the ones that are in 2 and 3, the Class C and Class B felonies. But this is not a greater lesser. Um, it's — they're alternative means. I think only if you got — set that aside would you get to the sort of schmuck analysis that I was going through with, with, um, with Justice Kagan. And I think one of the important things to recognize is about this offense is that, you know, in the t 50 percent of these offenders are ultimately charged with a violation that's unrelated to their flight, a serious felony unrelated to their flight. And the reason I think that's important is because what you were look the reason that they're traveling at such high speeds, the reason they're evading officers, the reason the typical case is not someone just going a couple blocks and stopping is because they've got drugs in the car or guns, they have parole violations or outstanding warrants. It is the background against which I think you have to assess the character of the, of the conduct here. And whether you're looking at it under risk or under the character of the conduct, the government submits that it easily satisfies the residual clause. Are there are no further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wall. Uh, Mr. Marsh, you have four minutes remaining. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. I would suggest that it's helpful uh, to start to look at uh, the in-kind part of the Begay test on a more general level than uh, we've been discussing. Could you succinctly tell me how this is any less purposeful, aggressive, or violent than escape from custody? What's your best answer to why this is just not identical to escape, which is a fleeing from situation just as this is? So, Justice Sotomayor, the, the basic distinction is that the person uh, who's charged with escape, uh, assuming that escape means escape from a secure institution or from a person, uh, is that the person is in custody. And it takes, um, in, the, in the ordinary case, uh, aggression and violence to get out of the custody of that person. Uh, the person who is fleeing is trying to avoid uh, being taken. Well, here an officer has told you to stop. They're trying to affect custody. And I don't know what the aggression or violence is <coughs> other than, you know, breaking a window, doing something. It doesn't require the escape that you actually injure someone to get out. It's just that you run away. I, th I think the phrase that you just uh, used is the distinction that I was referring to. The person who's fleeing is trying to avoid uh, being in custody. They're acting in a uh, — instead of going toward the officer and resisting, they're going away from uh, the officer. The person who's in custody has to uh, use some kind of force. Uh, and in Johnson, of course, the uh, — this Court referred to uh, violent as no, — that's not use. true. There, there are a lot of — you can uh, — there are prison escapes all the time where it's done through subterfuge. That's, that's true, Justice Alito. Uh, but as the Court held in James, 
finding uh, an example of a case uh, that would not be violent uh, does not solve the ordinary case. The ordinary case, uh, I would suggest, uh, requires something more than that. Sure. Well, it's, for me anyway, an important question. I'll let, I'm not sure the ordinary case does. I assume the ordinary prison escape is, I don't know, over the wall, under the, under the tunnel, or, you know, while the guard's looking a different way, or some distraction. I don't know that it's typical that when the guard is there, uh, you say, now's my chance. The typical case doesn't involve aggression. Of course, the, the, the ordinary case or the typical case, Mr. Chief Justice, is that uh, the Court needs to look at the conduct encompassed by the elements of the statute. Uh, and so we would have to look uh, at exactly what the statute uh, requires. Uh, the circuit courts have been very divided on uh, escape. Uh, in my circuit, the Seventh Circuit, uh, uh, the federal statute 751 has been held not to be which is the general uh, escape statute, not to be uh, a violent uh, felony. Uh, but again, the, the uh, Court talks about the ordinary case uh, in the James case for the purpose of uh, disabusing the idea that it, it, one can't get out from under the violent felony designation just by coming up with a hypothetical case or an example where it can be done uh, without, uh, without violence. Here I would suggest that counsel uh, has just created for the Court uh, some kind of a hypothetical case to define the typical or ordinary case. This Court has never done that. Uh, and this Court said uh, in James that it's important to stick to the conduct encompassed by the elements of the offense, because if we start factoring in other kinds of conduct, uh, several of uh, the things which have been mentioned by counsel for uh, the government, uh, that begins to raise appen- apprendi problems, uh, uh, which uh, is a, another whole issue. But, but the Court said in James, uh, uh, and, and I would uh, acknowledge uh, is the law, that so long as the 